Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Noor Khatib. I'm an emergency physician in Toronto and an assistant professor in Queen's University and lecturer in University of Toronto. I'm coming to you today. I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada, and I'm here to talk to you about COVID-19, a year in review of this devastating year we've had where we have learned a lot about ourselves, about medicine, and about how we can come together as one solid, united population. So I hope that you learn a few things today about COVID-19 that you can take back to your practice. I know at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, I uh, led a few simulation courses on COVID-19 for my group at Lake Ridge Health in Toronto, and I'm hoping to bring that to you. Um, I start my slide uh, with a somber black slide because this has been a rough year. It's important to recognize that. It's important to realize how it, one year later we have pulled through and will continue to pull through. Uh, it's a reflection on the lives that, have, that we've lost and the people, are lo the loved ones that we have lost. And it's important for us to realize that we've been through a lot this year and no matter how it, it has gone, uh, please realize you're a part of history. And as physicians and medical professionals, um, we we are now the front lines to help us pull through completely. And of course, the vaccine is the first step. So just thought I'd give you a moment of uh, reflection with a somber slide there. And then let's talk about the global epidemiology uh, that has encompassed this virus. So uh, in terms of COVID cases, deaths and uh, recoveries, uh, you see, and as we know from the news, the U.S. is number one in the world in confirmed cases, deaths. And um, as you see, the numbers are in the millions, 106 million confirmed cases and 2 million global deaths worldwide. Absolutely incredible, absolutely devastating. And these numbers are just from a couple of weeks ago. As you know, this virus just keeps... Uh, evolving in terms of news. So um, we look at the number, uh, the uh, population that it's affecting, mostly affecting the older population. And between March of just last year, and right now we're hitting the one year, I hate to call it an anniversary because anniversaries are usually related to happy things, but we're, you, we're, 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 we're hitting the one year, uh, one year uh, milestone of, 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 ha of this virus. And, and we see that there are waves, one, two, three waves, and we will. We are now uh, noted to be in our third wave of this virus. Unfortunately, it has affected um, the people of low socioeconomic status or people of uh, in in low income margins, and of uh, minorities as well. As this slide shows, at least in in the U.S., it has affected minorities more uh, than uh, than not. Uh, so very important to recognize that. In terms of transmission, this was a huge question at the beginning. Is it contact? Is it droplet? Is it airborne? Well, you know what? It's all of these things. And it depends on the ventilation in the room. It depends on, um, on the viral load of the person transmitting this to you. So this is important to recognize that it's all... Um, it, it, aside from, I mean, it, it's airborne as well. So that's important to realize is that we have had a, in Canada, in in uh, Toronto especially, we've had huge trouble with uh, nursing homes and retirement homes having a large number of COVID cases and COVID deaths. And we wonder why, how it's passed along. Well, it was passed along because this virus is airborne. And the ventilation systems in these old buildings that house the residents that are over 70, over 80 years old um, are, you know, not well ventilated. So the airborne disease will affect them uh, more. In terms of surfaces, we heard this at the beginning and people were cleaning their, their, their grocery bags. And you'll see that plastic um, lasts quite long in terms of uh, copper and cardboard. The virus stays there for less hours. Coughing, sneezing, singing, talking, or breathing, those are ways to transmit the virus. And you'll see how uh, masks really do prevent this. Um, in terms of the number of days that uh, once you're positive, how long you're going to stay uh, isolated, the number 10 and 14 comes to mind. Uh, if you remember at the beginning, we would always say you have to self-isolate for 14 days, 14 days that's because we didn't really know that much about the virus. But now that we've learned more, we've realized that actually it's rarely cultured in respiratory samples more than nine days after symptom onset. So usually we say now, 
okay, you're symptomatic from COVID, that's a 10-day self-isolation, okay? Very important to realize viral load is huge. And the ACOG, which is the American Association for Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, they uh, say that, that vertical transmission appears to be uncommon, although it is there. Uh, just before uh, symptom onset, uh, you could still you could still pass on the virus, even if it's before symptom onset. And this is why when we do uh, population tracing, we ask people, where were you two to three days, two to five days before you had started to have symptoms? So important to realize that this is a virus that, you know, it's, it, 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 we, I call it the lonely disease because of this massive self-isolation that needs to happen. And the fact that should you get into trouble, you're in the hospital by yourself with none of your contacts because of this high transmission rate and end rate of death in the older population. Um, if uh, we look at uh, here, so 23% in this study in, in China actually said that th this was due to asymptomatic contact. So that's, that's a huge number. That is definitely a huge number. And we see super spreader events happening where people are gathering uh, in large populations in indoors. Indoors is the main problem, okay? Gathering outdoors, less of an issue. But indoors, in this study, in this Japanese study, showed that almost 19 times higher odds of transmitting the virus uh, indoors versus outdoors, okay? And why does distancing work? Well, look at this. Your absolute risks reduces the further you are from the person who is infected. So that's why we say two meters, because as you see, it's much lower at the two meter mark. Uh, but, but obviously the further you are, the more, the further you are and the better ventilation you have in the room, the less likely you are to be infected. Efficacy of face covering. All these masks we're putting on, sometimes double masking, do they actually work? And in this study, in the system, systematic review, it shows that by and large, it really truly does work, okay? Um, so I'll show you actually, um, in terms of the study, it clearly says, I would say I would change that to two meters actually, because if you look at the graph here, it's clearly beyond two meters where your transmission or your absolute risk is, is less than 1%, okay? And in terms of virus detected from respiratory droplets, the, the people in the study who wore the masks were much, much less affected, okay? And this is for an airborne uh, airborne particle and aerosolized particles. The more covering you have over your face where you're not having any um, any association with like the air to your eyes, nose, or or, or mouth, the less likely you are to, have, to, to be infected. Um, in general, hand washing, you know all of this. PPE for healthcare workers, you absolutely know this. All right, so very important for us to realize, why am I mentioning this again? I'm mentioning it because it actually works, okay? It's easy, it's simple, but are there, these are things that actually work. How do they know we work? Because in, in countries like New Zealand, they've been able to eliminate the virus. Look at this. February is the first case, mid-March, they decided to go full on and implemented stringent countrywide lockdowns by March, early March, last known COVID isolated case. That's incredible. Only until June, like June, they decided that the pandemic is over. June 2020. We're coming towards June 2021 now. And this is the best, this is the best job any country's ever done. Now the only cases of COVID-19 in this country is due to people flying in. That's it. And when they fly in, they have 14 days of quarantine and that's it. They don't risk ruining ruining the entire economy and, and hurting the population and having the high number of deaths. Of course, to contrast this with how the US is doing, complete polar opposites, right? Complete polar opposites. All right, so in terms of healthcare workers, what are we expected to do? So if we're doing aerosolized gener generating procedures, procedures where um, the patient, let's say, will, will cough, and so the particles, the aerosols, uh, will be in the air or in the room during the procedure. For example, the other day, I had to put a chest tube in the patient. When I was putting the chest tube in the patient and they coughed, the air coming directly from their lungs out into the, into the room, that would have COVID 
if the patient's code positive. So doing that procedure, putting in a chest tube or a pigtail in someone with a pneumothorax, that I had to wear an N95. The rest of the day, I'm wearing a surgical mask and making sure I have good hand hygiene, surgical mask and face shield. That's all we need. Herd immunity, something we hear about in the news, something we hear anti-vaxxers, uh, sorry, not anti-vaxxers, we hear anti-maskers say uh, a lot. Well, why don't we let herd immunity take its course? Meaning that we're going to have protection of people uh, just by having a large proportion of the of the um, of the population immune. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if some people are protected, are immune, like the the blue people there, then less of the population will actually get the virus. Uh, so you compare the top part versus the bottom part, and that's the basic concept of herd immunity. Why does it not work in COVID nineteen? Because in COVID-19, it's not uniformly lethal throughout the population. And the population with the lowest risk of mortality is the population with the highest contact rate. So herd immunity may occur naturally with lower number of deaths. But this is, if we were to let herd immunity take its course, we would have large numbers of deaths in the population. So this is why this argument does not work. We cannot allow for large numbers of herd, uh, large numbers of deaths to occur to protect a small number of uh, uh, people in the population. So it, it's something to keep in mind. Um, and vaccinations, vaccinations will result in long lasting immunity in all the population, not only the people who um, who are protected from the from uh, the herd immunity part. So keep in mind, vaccinations work. We'll talk about them a little bit later as well. Um, in terms of Sweden, you've all heard about this. Sweden. Sweden decided we're not going to shut down. We're not going to lock down. And if you compare Sweden to the other countries, look at that. Very clearly failed response. Very clearly higher number of deaths. So there's no argument that, that is sound for having a less stringent uh, response. All right, so... Symptoms of COVID, clinical presentation, how does it look like? The estimated incubation period, we know it to be up to 14 days, with mostly people will start having symptoms between day five to day seven, okay? And um, in fact, if you are exposed to COVID, we tell you don't, uh, don't uh, get the COVID test yet, get it day five to seven. That's when it's more likely to be positive. If you're going to go get it now, that's fine. Just make sure you repeat it in day five to seven. These are the symptoms that we're all aware of in terms of um, in, ter in terms of COVID-19. You'll see different populations have higher uh, likelihood of different symptoms. But in general, if your patient has any of these, then you have to have some kind of suspicion for COVID-19. Now, um, COVID positive cases, mostly we're seeing that the symptoms are cough, fever, shortness of breath, fatigue, confusion. Those are the symptoms that there are highest symptoms for people uh, that, that are hospitalized, okay? Um, and now, what about the, other than the lungs, because we keep hearing cough, shortness of breath, we keep thinking that the lungs are the main source of us trying to figure out if someone has COVID. Not true. OK, I have seen many cases of COVID that have nothing to do with the lungs. I had a gentleman come in with diabetic ketoacidosis and he was COVID positive. I had another young girl come in um, with actually no symptoms, this two year old girl with no symptoms. Uh, and in the end, she actually ended up having MISC, which is I will talk about the multi multiple in inflammatory syndrome for children. So keep in mind, it doesn't have to be respiratory, although respiratory, as you see here, is just the highest nut percentage of patients with symptoms. Now, if you've heard the term long COVID, long L-O-N-G COVID, that is what we're describing when patients have, after they finish their COVID 14 days, after that, their post-COVID symptoms. And these vary largely but they're mainly fatigue, shortness of breath, joint pain, chest pain. So actually Toronto, we're thinking of opening long COVID clinics just to try to help the people who are experiencing these symptoms, experiencing these symptoms months later, okay? So keep that in mind. It's not a 14 day thing and it's over 
uh, it can have long-term implications. And that's why even if you're long, even if you're young and you you feel like, hey, COVID's not gonna affect me, it's gonna be mild, I'm okay. Uh, no, you could have long COVID symptoms. It's possible. In terms of diagnosis, in terms of screening, what does the WHO say? The WHO says, well, first off, if you have an acute onset of the symptoms there in box one, if you have at least three, then we can consider you might have COVID. Or if you have one of those, and it, um, and and you're and you're one of the people like in healthcare system, or you um, uh, work in an area with high transmission, then that would be a reason to go get tested. Or of course, if a patient has severe respiratory um, uh, illness at all. Okay, um, asymptomatic people in general uh, do not get tested, at least in Toronto. But there are areas in the world with high uh, percentages and those get tested even without symptoms. Okay. Um, and a probable case definition just has more of those symptoms. There are three types of tests for COVID-19, uh, the nucleic acid assays, the antigen tests, and then the antibody assays. I, I, the antibody assays, the third one, I've actually done that test myself. It tells you positive or negative. That's all it does. I don't think we have titers at this time, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least in Toronto, we do not have titers for antibodies at this time. Now, in terms of the nucleic acid assays, those are the ones that we're sending people in Toronto uh, to COVID assessment clinics and they're getting their RNA test where they have a swab that goes nasopharyngeally and they get their uh, positive or negative COVID that way. Antigen assays are a little bit different and um, they're less um, uh, they're less likely uh, to be, uh, they're less sensitive than the first one. Okay. So viral antigen one, uh, less sensitive than the one we are doing currently. The RNA one is the one that is high, uh, high sensitivity and high specificity. Um, but at the same time, if you don't have symptoms or if, or if it's negative, it doesn't absolutely mean that you don't have COVID. In terms of timing of the test, uh, sometimes people could turn positive the day before they have symptoms, but in general, between five to seven days of exposure or symptom onset, that's when people should be getting tested at this part right here, okay? That's when you know that the likelihood will be high that the test makes more sense, okay? So diagnostic accuracy of PCR and antigen, it's best performed, the PCR one is best performed. When I say PCR, I mean the one that would be labeled RNA, okay? And um, for example, the antigen test, which is the second one, uh, if the antigen test is positive, then the person's infected. But if it's negative, the antigen test does not exclude an infection, okay? So that's why I, I always refer to the PCR one is the better one that we are using. Chest abnormalities. I wanted to show you a few CT scans of people that are, that are, uh, that have had COVID. So here we start seeing ground glass opacities, more ground glass opacities, more ground glass opacities, and then finally getting better, obviously with proper treatment in between. And we'll discuss what those treatments are. So this study was conducted in Wuhan, China, very early in the pandemic. And, um, and, uh, and we, we learned a lot from our colleagues in China about, about this virus before we got these severe waves. Uh, X-ray findings, I remember back in April, I was looking at these x-rays every single day, every single day, bilateral pneumonia, bilateral pneumonia, likely COVID-19. Um, it can range in, it can range so much in how it looks. Okay. It can look like the one on the left, the one on the right. It could look awful like this. Either way, at the beginning, we try to get exposure. We try to which exposure risk and symptom risk, and we definitely get the COVID test. Now, how long are we immune after COVID? As you know, the immune response varies from innate immunity, adaptive immunity, immune memory cells. So this is what I'm looking for. How long am I going to have the proper cells to defend me, the proper antibodies to defend me months later? Months is actually approximately 90 days. Okay, so we know that approximately 90 days after being infected with COVID, you'll be okay. Now, this study... Um, that was done by Perriot and is this, um, uh, published in Blood magazine, basically tells you what the antibody decline looks like in a large uh, number of, um, of people in their, in, their, um, in their study. And it looks like everything hovers closer to like 
the uh, 60 to 90 day range. No one knows the exact number. And obviously this changes from person to person. What about pregnancy? I get so many questions about COVID and pregnancy. Are they less at risk? Are they more at risk? At the beginning of the pandemic, we actually said that they would be the same risk as non-pregnant women. But in fact, the more we learn about this, the more we realize that no, they actually are at increased risk uh, from COVID-19 than non-pregnant women. Meaning that a pregnant woman uh, that has COVID and a non-pregnant woman that has COVID, the pregnant woman is more likely to have more severe symptoms. So as you see here, in terms of hospitalization, ICU admission, needing ventilation, uh, the um, adjusted risk ratio is higher in pregnant women versus non-pregnant women. So that keep that in mind. So now we know definitive data that pregnant women are more at risk. All right. Um, and this is just the same idea, but another study uh, done in France and Belgium. All right. So what's the risk to my baby doctor? That I get that question quite a bit. Pregnant women with severe COVID-19 appear to have increased risk of preterm and cesarean deliveries. All right. And so this has increased the risk of PPROM, preterm deliveries, and obviously increases the risk for the baby. COVID-19 in children, very important, especially with us learning more about MISC. I'll explain what that is in a second. Deaths, uh, death rates increase with age. We know that. We saw that in the first slide I showed you. Death rates increase with age, but what about our youngsters? What about our 0 to 18-year-olds? What what can we expect or, or, or how worried should we be? Majority of children are going to be okay. The majority are going to be okay. MISC is rare in children, but devastating. Okay. What is MISC? Multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. I saw one case of this so far. And unfortunately, uh, the child had to go to sick kids and, uh, get, um, and be admitted in the ICU for two weeks and she had to get IVIG, and it was treated very much like Kawasaki disease. And I'll show you that actually uh, we started seeing higher rates of Kawasaki disease, but in fact, this was MISC. This was multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, what does it entail? It entails uh, having fever, inflammation, at least two organs having a problem, and exposure to COVID or positive test. The young girl that I saw, kept coming back negative for COVID, kept coming back negative. But when you actually dig deep into the history, you find out she was exposed to COVID at some point. And so she did fit the criteria of having MISC and needed higher intervention. How do they present? Symptom-wise, mostly fever and GI. Kids, fever, GI symptoms. A little different from adults. Kids really like, <laughs> personal story, my my poor nephew actually uh, got infected with COVID. And the first thing he did, unfortunately, this little guy comes up to me, he's, Auntie Noor, Auntie Noor, I, uh, I'm having a lot of diarrhea and I'm scared. And then later we found out that actually that's usually the number one symptom that comes up for kids. This is going to be hard because kids get gastroenteritis all the time. How are we going to figure it out? Well, think about it this way. When kids have gastroenteritis, they shouldn't really have fever and they shouldn't be feeling sick. But at the same time, we're going to treat this at the beginning very similar to just the gastro, and we're going to make sure they're well hydrated. Uh, a lot of them have conjunctivitis, a rash, and um, lastly, less, less so myalgias. They actually usually look quite well, okay? Except if they have MISC. If they have MISC, then we're looking for very severe signs, like Kawasaki disease signs, acute injury, rashes. Um, and the more important question you must ask yourself when seeing a child that you're even slightly suspecting COVID is do we have three or more days of fever and what symptoms does a child have and is this child in shock? This entire chart is very helpful and I will provide you with a handout to this chart. It's provided to us by sick kids and explains to us what we need to order in order not to miss the MISC syndrome in children. OK, we're calling it Kawasaki disease slash MISC. We do not want to miss it. And um, this is a way for you to to follow the chart and never have to miss this. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll provide this handout to you. 
Uh, there's a lot of testing, as you see in the handout, tons of tests. Why are we testing all these kids for three days of fever? Well, this is the significance. On the right side, you'll see this is what kids that unfortunately don't do so well. Thankfully, my, my nephew never got MISC and he got mild COVID and everything's fine. But there are kids who are unfortunate to actually get multiple inflammatory syndrome uh, that causes several of these, uh, these problems on the right hand side of this chart. In Toronto, between January and June, we noticed that actually uh, increasing cases of, of Kawasaki. Increases cases of Kawasaki, actually this was miss in the end, all right? Um, so in terms of management, definitely consult pediatrics and critical care, and do realize that kids are less likely to have serious illness, but always keep MISC in mind, all right? In terms of reinfection with COVID, it's important to realize it's not very common, but very possible still, okay? These are case studies that happened in uh, in all over and in, in, in these different places, and it shows that sometimes the second infection is, is, is mild, sometimes it's worse, you never know how it's going to happen with you. But in terms of reinfection, uh, the CDC basically tells you it's unlikely and especially unlikely before 90 days. Coagulopathy. There's a lot of talk about increased coagulation and COVID-19. Why does this happen? And this is a, a prospective study that basically showed lots of people getting PEs and DVTs. Uh, back in, um, was it March? March 2020, I had a 23-year-old male with a saddle pulmonary embolism. Why would a 23-year-old male have that? In the end, he turned out to be positive for COVID. Now, um, we do realize that like thrombosis and inflammation, they're both linked, okay? They're, they're both very much linked. And we know what Virchow's triad is, stasis, endothelial injury, hypercoagulability. And if you look at COVID-19's Virchow triad, kind of similar endothelial dysfunction, vascular endolitis, and increase in inflammation. So we know that there is a link. We don't know for sure. And now this is a study that says basically that people with severe COVID getting full dose um, anticoagulation did better. Um, but we, that's one study. We don't have exact data or RCTs that can tell us that, um, that we're okay to go ahead and anticoagulate people with high dose uh, anticoagulation. But we know for a fact that for uh, hospitalized patients, they have to receive prophylactic anticoagulation, just like any time, okay? Now, I have had patients that are very high risk for DVTs and they do get, co and if they get COVID, I then consult hematology to ask them if this is an appropriate exception and should we completely anticoagulate this patient before knowing the full story? So right now I'm trying to just plant the seed in your mind that, and that COVID has increased coagulation and that we are currently studying, trying to understand whether we should be giving people um, therapeutic anticoagulation, but at minimum, if they're hospitalized, it's definitely prophylactic. All right, now current supportive care we know this, we're treating the fever, we're treating um, the dehydration. In terms of moderate, what are we treating? We're treating uh, any co-infection, co such as pneumonia co-infection. We're treating this like a sepsis case and trying to find out if any end organ damage is happening. In terms of severe COVID, this is where it gets to um, the drugs that we don't use all the time. Okay, we know what the manifestations are. Now, what are the drugs that we don't use all the time? The ones highlighted in bold are the ones that uh, there's major discussion about their about their effectiveness. And in fact, I just want to highlight that these three right here, oxygen, dexamethasone, and remitted, hard to say that word, remdesivir, the antiviral remdesivir, dexamethasone, and oxygen are the main ways of therapy for moderate to severe COVID, okay? You are not supposed to treat with hydrochloroquine, no matter what a former president has told you. You are uh, not supposed to treat with glucocorticoids, so dexamethasone, if patient is non-severe. And when I say non-severe, I mean um, if their oxygen saturations are above 90 and, um, you know, if they're not too sick. But dexamethasone is a must if someone has oxygen levels less than 90.
all right? And as you see right here, it makes a difference for mortality. So we know for a fact this makes a difference for mortality. And this is the recovery trial, which, um, which proved to us the dexamethasone is the right way to go for participants that, that need oxygen, not the ones that do not need oxygen. The graph on the, re the uh, right is no oxygen. And we know that the ones that required oxygen are the ones that need dexamethasone. All right, so we've pretty much talked about this. For re the remdesivir, same thing. It is indicated for adults and pediatric patients with severe COVID, okay? So severe COVID, this one not necessary. So it's going to have to be oxygen levels that are more than 90%, uh, less than 90%, but also quite ill. So people in the ICU, people intubated, um, and it's important to realize that contraindications are basically hypersensitivity reactions, which how could you possibly know? It's not a drug that you give every day. Quick note about the variants, the UK and the South African variant. Why should we be worried about them? Only because they're fast spreaders, all right? They're very fast spreaders, um, and sometimes they're hard to diagnose with our tests, although our tests are getting quite good to diagnose them, but keep in mind they're fast spreading diseases. Now, the big question people ask me is, what about, you know, what about the uh, vaccines? What are the implications for the vaccines? It shows right here that in fact, for the UK vari variant, don't worry about it. For the uh, South African variant, it's Moderna is 6.4 fold reduction in neutralization activity of the vaccine, all right? But despite this, even 6.4 fold, is, is still giving you expected protectivity, okay? So still our vaccines are working. Uh, only time will tell because these variants are new. Um, but, and also the Pfizer vaccine is 0.81 fold reduction in neutralization activity of the vaccine. So the impact on mRNA vaccine efficacy in the real world setting remains unknown, but this is more in the research setting. So we won't know, and this is brand new information, so we won't know until we um, actually uh, continue to study people who've been vaccinated and whether they get COVID. Vaccine development, as you know, there's many candidates. Uh, the ones that I will quickly talk about are the mRNA vaccine data. 95% uh, for, um, for our Pfizer, 94.5, basically 95% for mRNA, two weeks after your second dose. Remember, these are two-dose vaccines. Um, more efficacious, uh, you know, if they're given as per how they've been studied. Um, and so right now we can say that, um, that the Pfizer vaccine is 16 years and older and the Moderna vaccine is 18 years and older. Okay. And in the vaccine clinic where I work and I'll be, I'll be in the vaccine clinic tomorrow morning, the main question we ask people are, do you have any allergies to previous vaccinations? And do you have any allergies to polyethylene glycol or Restorolax, the, um, the prep for colonoscopies, as you know, or if you're constipated, you take polyethylene glycol. So that's Restorolax over the counter. Most I've never heard of an allergy of that, but most people do fine with it. And most people, they get it over the counter and they have no issues. All right. So that's my main question. I ask other questions too, just so I know who I'm talking to, right? I ask, do you have autoimmune diseases? Do you have bleeding disorders? Are you any, on any blood thinners? Uh, are you currently sick with COVID? And are you pregnant or breastfeeding? I just want to know who I'm talking to. None of these are contraindications except for the allergy for PEG, but I do want to give them proper information for proper informed consent. So if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, I need to talk to them about how there's no studies, but the benefits highly outweigh the risks. So this is why we ask these questions. And of course, the two doses, 0.3 mils, I am three weeks apart for Pfizer. Um, and the warnings are basically uh, if you have any autoimmune disease or any autoimmune medications, your rheumatologist, for example, methotrexate, your rheumatologist might advise you, as per the American Rheumatology Guidelines, to pause your methotrexate the day of your vaccine and one week after. All right. So definitely people with rheumatoid arthritis, other rheumatological diseases, have them speak to their rheumatologist. And I can also provide you with the article from the American Rheumatology Association describing which drugs need to be paused. All right. So let me show you.
how lucky we have been this year. All right. I know it's a devastating year all throughout, but who would have thought that we can come up with this long list of vaccines? Someone's done something right because doing this in such a short amount of time, and I know people are worried about that. How come it was developed in less than a year? They did not take shortcuts with the methodology of the research. They did not take shortcuts with the volunteers or the administration or the medications, none of that. They took shortcuts for the paperwork, funding was provided, all the stuff that is red tape that makes a study take five, six, seven years was all taken out in order for us to save lives. Last year, this time, when we were terrified of this virus, could we have ever thought I would be able to show you a table this wonderful and this great that will save so many lives ahead? And really, I'll be honest to you, this is my last slide. Because to me, this is the most important slide. This is the slide is gonna, that's going to make it, make it all worth it and save lives for years to come. And as a united human population, we will get over this virus. I do want to thank you for your time and uh, please feel free to ask me any questions.